TikTok is a funny place. Lately, I've been watching a lot of Muslims who make red pill content, and they're speaking about relationships between men and women. And some of the advice they give is horrendous. And I think the worst advice is given by this guy named Mahdi Tijani, who actually has a large following. But in this video, I want to comment on the things he said. But I have to say that I am aware of his past. I'm aware that he's divorced multiple times. I'm aware that there's uh, domestic abuse allegations and he actually admit to some of it. And it's actually quite horrible, I have to say. But I don't want to get into all that. Those are his personal issues. But I just want to go over his advice and things that he said about relationships and other things. And I'm not an imam or anything like that. But I've had a traditional upbringing and I consider myself to be a traditional man. I just want to go over it and I'll just comment on it. The day my son was born and he came back from hospital, he went out to chill with his friends. And he'd be doing that all the time. So and so what? I would say to him... Oh, well, oh, Yusuf, he wanted to go and see his friends afterwards. Was he there with you in the hospital? Yeah. I mean, He's he a better man than me. Hospital. My wife went into labor. Yes. And I said to Habibti, mashallah, you got this? Yeah. I called the ambulance. They were on their way. Yeah. I made sure the door was open. I said, I'm off to bed. Not just that. You know, on the new iPhone, on the 13 onwards, you can yeah. put their white noise. Yeah. I put the ocean wave thing on, bruv, so that yeah. I'm not disturbed because it was... <laughs> Early in the morning, okay. like next to my ear. Okay. Do you understand? Yeah. Alhamdulillah, a couple hours later, we got a baby. Yeah. <laughs> You're just chatting. No, 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 it's not chatting. No, this is no, real no, story. No, the sad thing is that this is not the first person I've heard say this. There's a lot of youngsters in the Western world and are confused about the role of the husband or a man. Some of them, they think that because their fathers or their uncles who grew up in their home country, you know, it could be Pakistan, it could be Afghanistan, it could be Somalia, whatever, right? In all those countries, generally, men do not take part in labor process. And the reason is simple, because there's so many family members there. Her mother is there, her sisters are there, your mother, your sisters, aunties, grandmothers. There's so many people there that the man doesn't have a place. So genuinely, the men do not take part in the labor process. But then when it comes to living in the Western world, where your wife is completely alone, the idea that you just abandon her and go to sleep is abhorrent. It's ridiculous. And I'll just tell you a short story about my uncle, who is a very religious man. He has eight children. He had three of them in Somalia and the rest of them he had in the UK. After he lived in UK for like eight years, I met him and I asked him that, hey, you're living in UK, how's life there? And he just said to me like, you know, in Britain, both men and women give birth. In Britain, man has to be there at the birth and he's there the whole process. And then you are there the next day. And he's like, you're taking part in the whole process. So basically you are giving birth in a way. And he just starts laughing. It's like, sometimes I miss Somalia. You know, I didn't have to do anything. I was just sitting at the restaurant eating. And then somebody would come to me and be like, hey, you have a son. And then I'll be like, Alhamdulillah, and then I'll continue eating. But then he realized that when he went to Britain, that's not something he can do because this is a matter of safety and security. You live in a non-Muslim country and even if it's a Muslim country, if you're in a situation where it's just you and your wife, how can you allow people who you don't even know, a random people, to take care of your wife and your child without you not even being there? And then what if there's complications? Quick decisions have to be made. Do you want the random doctor to make the decisions without your input and you are responsible for your wife and child that's what we believe right that the husband is responsible well it's your responsibility on top of that you know when the wife comes back she comes home if you don't have anyone to help you out let's say after that you know your mother comes there or her mother comes there there's family members sure like go out go be with your friends relax a bit right but the idea that she's there alone after giving birth for how long 14 15 hours maybe even longer 20 hours two days who knows you don't understand how tired that person is what if she falls asleep and then the baby needs something we all know that you know babies in that stage they vomit they need to be picked up they need to be burped there's so much things you need to do I'm not an expert on it, but I'm just saying that it's extremely risky. Leave the man alone. If he wants to go out, let him go out. If he comes home late one day, don't ask him where were you. Unless you want to be his mum, don't mother him. Because the moment you mother him, he's going to become like a boy. Either he will acquiesce and give in to you, start behaving like a child, or he will constantly fight you. Both outcomes are bad. If he wants to go out with his mates, let him go out with his mates. Who are you? You're not his mum. You're his wife. You are his subordinate. You should be telling him when you go out and when you come home. Since when does the boss tell the the, the employee oh i'm checking out employee and i'll cut no
let's talk about polygyny. Doesn't it create a kind of competitiveness between women? Your job, there is only one position for it. But your boss decides to hire another person to do the exact same job as you. The reason being is he wants to pick the best one. Are you going to feel under more pressure to perform or not? Yes, well, because you give it, you are giving me a circumstance of a job, of course, because you are rewarded in this. Yes, and my wives are employed. They have job. Their job is to blaze me. What is the problem? Isn't our job to worship Allah. But I think taking employment as an example is a terrible one because this is not the same kind of relationship. And even if you have multiple wives, so it's not like you marry four wives and then it's a matter of survival that one of them will stay in there. No, all four of them think that they're going to be there regardless of anything. So it doesn't really create competition in that sense. It does create competition in other sense. For example, who gets the biggest TV? Who gets the most money out of you? Who gets the nicest travel? It does create a different type of competition. It's something that you have to be aware. And anyone who's had a multiple wives will tell you it's not the easiest thing to manage. But even if we take this example of employment, I think he's misunderstanding what work life actually is. A good boss will generally always tell his employees where he will be so that they can reach him and so that they know that he's working. And in most of the time he will be at the office and if he goes somewhere in a meeting, he will say, hey, I'm meeting this person, I'm trying to close this deal. And he will be transparent because if the employees don't know what the boss is doing, if they think that the boss is just chilling with his friends, he's at the coffee shop, he's at the beach, why should they work hard if you are just chilling and not doing anything? A boss should set an example by his action. All the good bosses are very transparent with what they do with their time. And generally bosses try to come at the office before the workers and they leave after the workers. And that creates an environment of trust because they can trust that you are working hard. So it motivates them to work hard. Same thing with your wife. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with your wife asking, hey, okay, you're going out. What, what time do you think you'll be back? Well, then she can prepare. She can cook for you. She can clean the house. She can put some clothes on. She can put the perfume on, you know. But if you go out and you're like, why are you asking me this woman? Shut up. I'm going to come whenever I want. How can she prepare for you? At least I would appreciate when I open the door. You know, we have like the, we call uns, you know, the burning of incense you know, house is clean, your wife looks good, good food, you'll have a good night. And that's why I would say that, hey, I'll be around that time. And if I tell her when I'll be back and she's actually ready for me, you know what? The next day I'll do the same thing. My, hus my boyfriend ran away. My husband ran away. Okay, he ran away. And you, you opened your legs. Why'd you open your legs to him for? He's a deadbeat dad quite normal, but you as the woman chose him to inseminate you. Generally, we encourage quick marriages. We don't encourage long time getting to know a person for years, vetting them for everything. Generally, we tend to say, let the family vet a short term getting to know the person and then you get married. Now, so if you follow this path and you got married quickly and the person when you were asking them questions, they answered everything religiously, the family was good, and your family was like, listen, everything seems to work out, and then you married that person, and it turns out that that's a complete monster, right? And then you have child, and the guy leaves. The idea that you would blame the woman for that is totally ridiculous, because how is she supposed to know? Unless it's a totally different situation, if she says that, hey, I want to marry X person, and then everybody's like, listen, this person has been married multiple times, he doesn't take care of their children, and then she has children with that person, then you can say that, hey, listen, you knew that when you were getting into this situation, but we all know that you get to know a person after the vows, not before that. But let's get on to the next one. Young man, I'm talking to you. You are not a lost cause, my man. You can become the alpha you always wanted to become. I am saying to you, though, you must surround yourself with alphas. You need to surround yourself with sharks because only a shark can teach a man how to become a boy, sorry, how to become a shark. I don't know about this one. I don't know if it makes any sense for a young man to travel the world and think about, hey, let me find somebody who's alpha or beta or whatever, right? Whatever you want to do, let's say you want to be IT engineer, 
you should be surrounding yourself with people who are IT engineers who can help you with your career. Those people might be alphas, they might be betas, they might be whatever. And this concept of alpha, I don't think it exists in our religious vocabulary. I don't think it's something that imams talk about, that hey, a man should be an alpha. I've never heard it, so I'm incredibly skeptical about it. But I could understand as a man that, okay, you want to be the top dog, you want to be the man. But you should surround yourself with the type of people you want to be. Now, when it comes to your marriages, you shouldn't surround yourself with people who are failed in their relationships completely if you want to learn about relationships. So maybe get the religious people who can teach you how to vet a person, who can teach you what kind of person might be a good wife, and then go for that kind of person and surround yourself with people who have happy family lives if you want a happy family life. And as a Muslim, you should surround yourself with a good people who are humble. And I don't know if humble people are generally considered alphas in the Western world. When I come home from work and I've finished, from, finished my day, I will grab my youngest son, who's four years old, and I and him will do a selection of exercises together. After we've done that, I'll sit him down and I'll do Quran with him. In total, it's 20 minutes to half an hour. But after I've done that, especially after I've come home from a long day, it's the first thing I do before I let my hair up, before I relax, before I sit down, before I get too comfortable. I immediately feel a sense of guilt rise, leave me. I feel like I have invested in my son for the day. Could I have done more? Sure. But it would have cost it would have come at the cost of something else. I would have had to have sacrificed something else, namely work. And here's the thing of trying to do too much at once is that if you over invest in time and effort with your kids, the more time and effort you are spending investing on them emotionally with your mind, with your body, the more of a burden it will become upon you to keep this habit up. I don't know, I might be reading too much into this, but there's just something that doesn't sit right with me with this one. I don't understand the concept of counting the time you spent with your children. And you shouldn't consider it as a burden. You shouldn't think about, hey, if I invest more than 20 minutes a day into my kid, then that will be for my job. And even if it is from your job, isn't that the sacrifice that you should make? But generally, I do think that consistency is the key but the reality is that if you are working certain days you have more time certain days you have more energy and in those days it's perfectly normal to spend more time with your children and then sometimes you might be very stressed and that day you spend the minimum and then you relax the rest of the day that's how life goes it goes in cycles i don't think it should stress you out and i do like the fact that they do exercises and then they read the quran and if i'm completely honest i think it's better than most fathers do and that's the sad reality of the current states but i don't think that i should go around and say that i spend 20 minutes a day with my kid like i don't think that's something to be bragged about if you want your house clean, hire me a maid. I agree with Sister Amina. I agree. I'll hire the maid and I'll marry the maid. Boom. Oh. I'll marry the maid. <laughs> okay. So you know, you know, because I, I'll hire her and marry her. There's like 10 other clips that I wanted to comment, but this video is getting really long. So I'll finish with this one because this is sort of a half joke. And there's two things I want to say here, right? Firstly, I just want to comment. I watched this episode and the guys that were sitting on this table they were saying things like oh as a traditional man i'm a traditional man i'm a traditional man but the reality is that this woman is married traditional men do not sit around a table debating with married women about their marriages they were telling her what kind of relationship she should have with her husband and things like that i felt that was completely disrespectful toward her husband. The whole idea that you would call yourself a traditional guy and you're debating married women about relationships and marriages, I just find it a bit odd. But if we get to the point of marrying the maid, actually, in my country and in most parts of the world, having maid is not that uncommon. I know in the Western world, having a maid is outside of the norm. And let me just tell you, do not do it. Because at the end of the day, the day you marry her, she will 
stop being your maid and she will become your wife and when she becomes your wife she will tell you hey the other wife used to have a maid so where is my maid and now you have two wives and both of them are demanding mates so you went from not wanting to hire one maid into having to hire two mates never do that i've actually met people who've done it it doesn't work out i just want to finish with this that i generally try not to give advices because at the end of the day there is a hazard to this this man you want clicks you want people to watch you so you are going to say audacious things and then when you say those audacious things you are contradicting certain religious principles so when it comes to religion advice on marriages advice on life you cannot add clickbait to it and a lot of the things he said i think are clickbait and if i ever have time i'll do part two but i hope you liked this video and if you did please remember to subscribe like share and comment